Right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be too offended by it. Um, we embrace it. Um, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. We do this show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, and it is recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website, and you'll find all of our recordings for all of our previous shows going back to when we first started in 2009 are all there on the website, so you can watch them. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, so we do have people from all across the country, it looks like, here today, which is great. And we do all sorts of things in the show, a mixture of presentations, book reviews, training sessions, um, anything related to libraries, we want to share it and get it on the show, so um, we do that. We have commission staff that do, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations, and we bring in guest speakers. And today we have a mixture of that, which happens sometimes. Um, and we also do once a month, which is what we're doing today, um, is a Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, who is sitting next to me here. Yeah, He's our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And he comes on once a month to do something more techie oriented. Sometimes we have other sessions that are that way, but this mm -hmm. one definitely is. If you're into that kind of thing, <laughs> this is when you want to be here. So um, I'm just going to hand over to you, Michael, and you right. can take it away and explain who's here and what you guys are all doing. Okay. Great. Thanks, Krista. Uh, so yes, as Krista mentioned, uh, this is our uh, October 2013 Tech Talk. And uh, what we're going to do this time around is uh, I co-presented a two-hour session at the Nebraska Library Association conference about three weeks ago with Marcia, who's sitting here next to me in at the commission, and Gordon Wyatt, who's uh, out at the um, at his library. Gordon, can you say hello? Make sure we're all here. Hello. All right. <laughs> so uh, we did a, a two-hour session called uh, Tinkers, Printers, and Makers, Makerspaces in the Library. We're going to attempt to compress that down to an hour here for our uh, session today. And uh, we should be able to do it, if nothing else. We don't have the hands-on portion uh, there. Uh, Gordon actually brought his 3D printer with him to our session there. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, I think Marcia is going to start. I'm going to jump in, then Gordon's going to take over, and then uh, I take over a little bit, and then we go back to Marcia again, if I think I remember all that uh, correctly. And uh, I'm going to be running the slides from this end. So uh, especially when we uh, get to Gordon and he's a little remote, uh, I'll do my best to kind of keep the slides and him uh, in sync. So uh, why don't we go ahead, Marcia, and take it over. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be here. We are going to do a modified uh, presentation, like I said, of our NLA presentation a few weeks ago. Uh, so first of all, let's go ahead and talk about what makerspaces are. Now, I'm assuming if you're here today, you're interested in makerspaces in your library. Either it's something that you're planning, you're scheming, you're dreaming, or maybe you have something already in, in place and you want to go ahead and expand on that. And that's really cool. Um, makerspaces are basically a physical location where people can come together and they can be creative. Um, it can be anything from real high tech with 3D printers and laser cutters and computer software that you wouldn't believe, or it can be more low tech, a place that is uh, inspiring. People can come in and they can do everything from knitting and crafting to a mix of all types of media. So they're really cool places. Uh, traditionally, uh, the idea of tinkering is something that maybe your grandpa did in the garage. He had a, a workbench, um, you know, all kinds of neat tools, and um, there's always stuff there, and you could make things, right? And, and we've kind of lost that nature, um, that ability to do tinkering. And so this is a nice community-oriented space in the library where people can come in and get creative. Now, you don't need a ton of high-tech stuff. We are going to talk about 3D printers and software and all the different bits and pieces that make a cool makerspace. But honestly, just providing the space and telling people that you want them in your library to be creative is enough to get started. Um, libraries are all different. Here in Nebraska, we know of one 3D printer in a public library, which is Gord's Library, and he's going to talk about that. I work at UNL, and we have at least six 3D printers on campus. A variety of departments and colleges have the 3D printers, and they're using them for their students and their graduate programs. Um, I'm not sure what's going on elsewhere in Nebraska. That's why we're here, and we want to talk to everybody about it. But I know that this is something that's percolating. I've talked to enough people who are interested. And so if you are using Makerspace in your library, and you're not in Nebraska, and you're listening in, please let us know. Uh, let the, Krista know in the chat room so we can kind of keep track of what's going on. And if you are in Nebraska and this is something you're thinking about, let us know, because we really want to build support for this and, and share amongst ourselves what we're doing and how we can support each other. 
So moving on, our next slide, we're not actually going to watch this YouTube video. I highly recommend it after the show. It's not a long video, but what it does is it takes a look at what a makerspace looks like in the library. It's really cool to watch. It shows you um, 3D printers in action, kind of how the space is and, and the bits and pieces that go with it. Um, but once again, due to the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and skip it. But please watch it after the fact. There's plenty of public libraries and academic libraries that are using uh, 3D printers in their library and making makerspaces. If you're all librarians, Google it. You'll be able to find it. So moving on. We're going to spend some time in this show talking about what 3D printers are. Now, we have some pictures, so you're going to be able to see them. Um, and Gordon's going to explain what his 3D printer uh, looks like, how it operates, and how he got it in his library and that kind of thing. And Michael's going to talk about other um, really cool makerspace gadgets that are available. So we'll go ahead and get started on that. Uh, once again, if you have questions, let Kristen know, and we'll address them as we're talking about them. We'll try and hit all the biggies, and I know there's always other stuff on the market. So creating a makerspace can be as simple as providing Legos. Uh, I, I just want to start there. You, you, if nothing else, that's what you do with Legos is you create things. And I mean, you could have Duplos for the smaller kids. You could have Legos uh, for the bigger kids. And when I say bigger kids, I'll, I'll include me. And <laughs> Marcy is raising her hand. Um, you know, at a certain level, I kind of miss uh, the... Um, I, I kind of miss the uh, two five-gallon buckets full of Legos that, that oh, yeah. uh, I grew up with, with me and my brother. Um, but I do still have uh, some of my Legos and, I, and put together an Imperial Star Destroyer a couple I, of years I ago. And you still have Legos, Legos? Architecture ones. Those are pretty cool. Yeah. Those are all over the um, house. <laughs> so, you know, it can be as simple as Legos. But then if you want to take it even further, sticking with Legos, Lego Mindstorms. Uh, now, over here on the right is um, the Lego Mindstorms robot that you'll see. And this is kind of the... Um, project that you always see is the demo for that. But the idea is that you have Legos, but then you can program them to move in certain ways. Now, the other thing though, if you can take this to an extreme, and in the lower left-hand corner there you can see a Rubik's Cube, a bunch of Lego Mindstorms, and a smartphone. And what this is, is it's a Lego, or it's, excuse me, it's a um, Rubik's Cube solving Lego Mindstorms robot. And so you shuffle up the uh, Rubik's Cube, you set it into the middle of this thing so that the camera on the phone can see what side it's looking at, what colors it's looking at. It rotates the cube to figure out where all the colors are, and then it literally solves the Rubik's Cube in less than six seconds. And there are YouTube videos for this. Yeah. Just look up, you know, Mindstorms, uh, Rubik's Cube Solver, things like that. Um, they are, it, it's amazing. And so this is taking that concept of Legos and makerspaces and throwing in a little programming and some app development. I've kind of jumped from putting together little things in Legos to, to seriously techy things. But that just shows kind of the, the range you can use with Legos and uh, things that you can put together. So um, at, this is another one I'm going to talk about before I hand it over to Gordon. If, if uh, those in our audience remember uh, Spirographs. Uh, basically, I grew up with those where you'd stick the pen in the little gears and you'd draw little things. Uh, this is called a spin bot, and the idea is you add some pens, you put it together, and then it's got little motors on it. What it actually does is it kind of loose form spirograph, and the robot moves around and draws while it's moving. So you do uh, learn a little bit of robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, you create something in the end, not just the robot itself, but you also create the art that comes out of it. Uh, it says use with markers, chalk, and more. I'd almost want to see maybe a bigger version of this with like sidewalk chalk, you know, go out and run one of those on the, on the, the sidewalk of the street um, because, you know, just yell car when there's a car coming if you're playing in the street. <laughs> uh, so, you know, again, a little bit of robotics, a little bit of creating, but something that, um, you know, it says uh, not for children under three, but they're, so they're saying, you know, three, four-year-olds with some basic help and instruction could put something like this together. So you've, you've got kind of a wide variety of... Uh, almost toys that you can get these days to uh, kind of help create that makerspace and teach kids some skills. So with that, we are going to now jump to 3D printing. So Gordon, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it over. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I kind of went overboard when I when I added stuff to this, this uh, PowerPoint for the conference. So I'm going to go very, very quickly. If you have any questions at any time, feel free to 
email me, even if they're big, long, crazy questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, anyway, as far as 3D printing is concerned, it's, it's what's called additive fabrication. Um, and there are four different real, four different methods that are generally used. Uh, the first two, selective laser sintering and stereolithography, both use lasers. Um, selective laser sintering uses lasers to fuse a powdered um, material, any kind of material, until it, it fuses together and can create really cool things. Uh, stereolithography uses a, a vat of resin and it takes a, shoots lasers at it in order to, to harden that resin in specific areas. It also makes really cool things. Now those are really fun because they've got lasers. Um, come on. <laughs> the third one is uh, the powder bed and binder. And um, this is, these are usually very, very large, very, very expensive. Um, it is the only 3D printing solution that is currently available that will print in full color. Um, this is the process that makes the famed um, World of Warcraft figure prints. If you play World of Warcraft and saw these prints and was desperate to print your character, this is the, the, the what's, it, what's the word I'm saying? The, the process that, that does it. Creates a little, a little layer of powder that then uses uh, essentially inkjet printer technology to, to squirt out full color binder into that powder and then you get really cool looking things. Uh, the bulk of the 3D printing that you are going to see um, in libraries or really anywhere else at the moment is called fused deposition modeling. And what this does is uses a print material with relatively low melt point that's extruded through a heated print head. Very much like a, a hot glue gun squirts out glue and melts it out of the little head. What this does is it creates filaments that are pressed together layer by layer by layer. It's used by probably 99.9% .9 of all consumer 3D printers. Um, it tends to be rather, you know, it, it, it's relatively quick um, depending on the, the level of complexity you want to use. And you can create all kinds of really cool things with it. There's an example of Yoda. <laughs> so. Now that I've given you a really, really brief introduction of what 3D printing is, here's some things that you can make with it. What you're looking at here is what's called the Blizzdent toothbrush. It's a toothbrush that's 3D printed from a mold that you can get your dentist to make of your mouth and you send it into this company. And uh, they can print it out for you for about $300. And it has the effectiveness of three minutes of traditional toothbrushing in six seconds. Stick it on your teeth and really? grind your teeth a bit. <laughs> Chris is cool. looking a little uh, <laughs> unconvinced. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. Basically, if you if you look closely in there, you'll see the the outside is the shell, and then inside there's all these little tiny bristles that are all designed to go in there. And whether it works the way it's advertised, I don't know, but it's still pretty cool. Um, the next thing we've got is a um, a stint for a um, uh, Kaiba. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill his name. Kaiba Gianfrio, um, who was uh, born with a, a problem where his, his windpipe was collapsing and it was preventing him from breathing correctly. Uh, so what, what a bunch of uh, researchers and doctors got together and decided they could 3D print a stint that would be able to hold his windpipe open and let him breathe, which is kind of freaking cool, really. Uh, <laughs> So there's some just fun kind of medical type things you can use, but you can also, 3D printing has also found itself in fashion a lot over the past couple of years. In fact, if you've recently watched uh, this season's um, Project Runway, uh, one of the contestants actually 3D printed accessories for his runway show, which is pretty slick. But here are some really neat shoes that you can buy 3D printed for only $900, or, you know, you know, you could get crafty and make your own with a 3D printer at your library. You can also make tools, which are really cool. This one is um, just done with, with uh, standard fused deposition modeling 3D printer. Um, you'd think, well, that's just plastic. It's the same stuff they make Legos with. How could that be a good tool? It actually works pretty well. Uh, the prints come out rather sturdy, so it's kind of impressive. Gordon, all, all, all three of us, Krista said it out loud, but the other two of us were thinking it, and they said, have you ever stepped on a Lego? 
They're pretty strong. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, as far as stepping out of Lego and then using a wrench to knock yeah. loose a bolt or something, you know, maybe a little bit different. But they are pretty powerful. But how about some fun? Well, you can print off all kinds of stuff for games. Um, this is a game that um, is that you can download from, from Thingiverse for free and print off. Uh, Pocket Tactics is what it's called. It's really cool. You print little figures and little tiles. It's really slick. Um, and that's really fun. For all you Settlers of Catan enthusiasts, you can find models to print off uh, 3D representations of the tiles. So your board does no longer has to be a, a rather cheap-looking cardboard representation of an island, which is pretty fun. And uh, you can also print off fun little action figures like BMO here. Um, basically, there's all kinds of things you can, that you can print with a 3D printer from the practical to the fun to the crazy to all kinds of stuff, including Legos themselves. Um, you can print all kinds of custom Lego pieces that you can kind of see here, new gears and, and, and drive shafts for your, your Mindstorms, pretty much anything you need. In fact, in there you can see um, adapters that people have made for to use your Tinker Toys with your Legos. It's, it's all kind of really cool. Gordon, I'm going to throw in here one more example that I just found this morning, so I don't know a lot about it, but we'll include it in the show notes. A, um, a young man who was uh, basically born without fingers on one hand, uh, he and his father bought a 3D printer and have been actually making kind of like a robotic hand at home for the kid. Um, so I, I just I just read about that. I just heard about this morning. I found an article. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah, that's really, really slick. Um, I didn't know about that. I'm going to have to take a look at that. Yeah. That's like the like absolute prime definition of, of being a maker right there. That's crazy. Um, but anyway, those are some examples. Now you want, okay, well, that's pretty cool. I want a printer in my library. So I'm going to go through a few quick examples of the ones that are probably the best bet for library use. What you're looking at here is a MakerBot replicator. Um, the, the company that makes the MakerBot was really the first company to really make a dent in the consumer market of uh, 3D printers. And what they have here is the, the newest version of that printer. Uh, you can buy it fully assembled for $2,200. It, it's got you know, good print resolution, um, basically all the things that you would need. It can print using PLA filament and ABS plastic. ABS plastic is what they use to make Legos. PLA is slightly more malleable and, and uh, useful. Uh, they have a dual extruder version which lets you print with two different colors for you know eight hundred dollars more. Well, six hundred dollars more. I can do math. Um, another good example is uh, the Cube. The Cube is a 3D printer if Apple made it. It's, it's sexy, it's really cool, it's got wireless uh, and all of it is proprietary, which means it's incredibly expensive, but it's incredibly user friendly. Um, it's it's the, the software that they have for it is super super easy to use. They've got kids making incredible things. It looks great sitting on a desk. It looks great, you know, anywhere. It's just really 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 cool. Uh, you do have to buy your your filament in cartridges, which you can see there on the left left side of that printer, um, which. You know, you don't get a whole lot of, of um, filament in there compared with the spools that you would buy for other printers. And, you know, also you have to buy it direct from them. Uh, but it's super easy to install. You just clip it in there and stick the, the filament into the, the extruder and, and you're good to go. It's very simple. Um, prints with ABS and PLA. What you're looking at here is the big boy version of the cube. Also looks really, really cool. It is currently the only consumer ready 3D printer, at least that I know of, that has a triple extruder head um, option, which means you could print in three different colors with three different filaments, which is really, really cool. And I want one just for that. But it is very, very expensive. As you can see, it's uh, 2500 for the baseline, 3000 for the second extruder head, and 4000 for the third extruder head. As with the small cube, everything's proprietary, which means it's much more expensive. However, it's super, super easy to use. Uh, it uses Wi-Fi connectivity, so you don't need any cords. Um, in fact, you don't even really need a computer for these. You can stick your um, print file onto a USB and just shove it in and print right from that. It's really, really cool how, 
how user friendly these are. This company really has the, the user friendly consumer ready stuff with 3D printers down to a T, but you really do pay for it. Um, the next option is the one that, that I went with at my library, which is the Solid Digital 2. Uh, for my money, well, for my library's money, really, well, more accurately, Nebraska Library Commission's money, because uh, we were able to get a grant for, through them. This is what's going to give you the best bang for your butt, buck. They've got a fantastic community. It's relatively cheap. Um, it comes pre-assembled and ready to print. However, you can tweak it to, to hell and back. It, it really is a really versatile machine. Um, there's people in the community that have done all kinds of crazy things. Um, one example, just to give you an idea, uh, all of these printers that I've showed you print between a 0.1 millimeter to 0.3 millimeter layer thickness, which is to say on the z-axis, you know, from bottom to top, that's how thick one layer is. There's a person in the Solid Doodle community that has his printer able to print at a 0 .1, 0 .1, 0 .01, excuse me, millimeter layer thickness. Now, granted, he had to change a lot of pieces in the printer and write his own code for slicing and, and, and the print program, but um, that's just ridiculous how, how good that resolution is, all on a printer that costs between $500 to $700. Uh, they do have a upgraded version called the Solo Doodle 3, which costs $800. It comes stock with with pretty much everything that the uh, the top level of the Solo Doodle 2 comes with. It's got a, a 8 by 8 by 8 inch print area, which is really huge. Uh, the heated print bed, which is very important for any printer because it, it prevents the print from from warping. It has the same great community, of course. It's able to print an ABS or PLA filament, prints out of the box, and it's highly tweakable, just like the Solid Doodle 2. And it's, it's just fantastic, fantastic. Everything about these printers is open source, including the software used to print things. The, uh, you, they give you designs to print replacement parts if you need to on your printer. Like, everything that, that you could possibly need to do with these is open source. It's very easy to use, very easy to play with, very easy to improve. Um, so really, those are the best ones for um, your buck, but there's more available all the time. Uh, just a simple search through Amazon or, or Google will show you a bunch of different ones that are available. Uh, what you're seeing here is just some of them. I just took a, you know, borrowed some pictures of just a few. And there's, at any given month on um, Kickstarter, there's anywhere between five to ten 3D printer projects. Uh, the one on the left here is the Z Pro, which I think just finished. It's an incredibly cute little desk-ready model that prints very, very white, very, very well. And the Peachy printer, which is intended to be a a pocket stereolithography printer. I'm not entirely certain how that works, but it's really cool, and I hope to see one works one day. Um, so even just checking on Kickstarter, you can find some great things. Now, obviously, I wouldn't suggest Kickstarter for library use, but, you know, if you want to get one yourself, it might be a good place to check out. Yeah, Gordon, that's um, how I'm getting mine in February. <laughs> what are you getting? Uh, I, it's the Buccaneer Pirate mm. Printers. I, I, there's a particular name to it. But for 400 bucks, I it, it might be proprietary, but I just want one to play with. I mean, really. Yeah, that one looks fun, actually, yeah. so. That's cool. And there's not just the, the more um, fused deposition modeling printers are available every day, but this one itself is the Form 1, which is made by Form Labs and is the first consumer available stereolithography printer that has seen mass production. Uh, it costs $3,300, and the resin costs about $130 per bottle. But you can create, you know, stereolithography prints with it, which are incredible, high resolution, just amazing, amazing things. This is one I want to get, and hopefully we'll be able to get next year. Uh, <laughs> um, but in addition to these, you've got all kinds of fun tools, including uh, 3D scanners. What you're looking at here is the, okay, I've got to find my notes because I can't remember what it's called, um, the MakerBot Digitizer which uh, when they released it, it actually uh, crashed the site um, because the demand for it was so high and they ran out of uh, supplies. Uh, it costs $1,400. What you can do is you 
take an object that you want to print out or make a make a digital scan or a 3D scan of. As you can see here, there's a little steampunk gnome sitting there. What it does is it spins around and there's a little camera that you see below the, the M there on the back of that little truss. Um, that just takes a bunch of pictures and it stitches together those pictures into a three-dimensional representation, which you can then print out, which is really cool. Um, but in addition to that, you have all kinds of other 3D scanners that are currently available. Um, Michael, you know a bit more about this one, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, this one's a, a Kickstarter project. I want to back up here for a second. In, is, as Gordon was explaining on this one, um, you, you set the object on the turntable and it rotates the object. Well, sometimes you might... It, it, it all, you can only put an object so big on this and make it work, you know, as, as you can see with the little gnome. Whereas this Kickstarter project, which the, the name of has, has escaped me, but it's an attachment to your uh, iPad. And you clip that on, and it's a 3D scanner, but you, you're you the one who moves. You move the iPad around the object. So if you wanted to, say, 3D scan somebody's head, you can't take their head off and put it on a little platter to turn around. That would be kind of uh, defeating the purpose of scanning their head. This, you can just have them stand still, and you, you move around them. And I think this is running about, I think, less than $200. It's not out yet, but... Uh, like I said, Kickstarter project, and there, there, there's more of these coming out uh, each day as with just about all of this technology. But if you don't have the kind of budget to buy a scanner, um, there are free versions that are available. I mean, pretty much everybody has a smartphone which has a high megapixel camera just right inside of it. There's a, um, a web app or a program you can download by Autodesk called 123D Catch. Um, you just take several pictures of a stationary object from various angles and load it into the application, and it has its own stitching algorithm, which will create a 3D model. Um, it's not going to, it might not be as good as, say, the, the MakerBot replicator or an industrial 3D scanner. However, it will do the job. As you can see here, somebody took a picture of a little, uh, or did a scan of a toy Tyrannosaurus Rex there, and on the right you see the 3D representation of it. Um, and then you can just take it into a 3D program and, and clean it up and you're ready to print, which brings us to 3D programs. Now the ones that you want to use for the library, the ones I would suggest anyway, are the ones that are of course free because let's, let's face it, you know, we're all on a budget. Now there are three that are very good. Blender, which is my pick, is free, it's incredibly powerful, it's got an amazing community with incredibly, incredibly diverse and, and excellent tutorials and and, um, and video tutorials and uh, it's, it's used for creating games, it's used for creating movies. The one downside to this is it's so powerful and it has so many options it might be a little confusing for um, many of your, your, your patrons. It, there's a bit of a learning curve but once you're on that curve you pick it up pretty quick. The other two are much easier to make, but you are limited in terms of the complexity of what you can do, at least, you know, working things easily. 123D is also by Autodesk, like 123D Catch. It's free. It's very easy to learn. It just uses common um, um, primitives in order to, to create objects. By primitives, I mean like cubes, cylinders, um, planes, uh, pyramids, things like that. Uh, it's also available as a web app. If you just go to that website there, you'll, you'll see it. The other one is SketchUp Make, which is also free. It's very, very easy to learn. Like 123D, it can be difficult to make complex models. SketchUp Make actually works really, really well for doing simple kind of architectural um, representations, like if you're wanting to design a room. However, it can be used to create models and, and, and things like that. They're all free, they all work really well, and they all have you know, some tutorials and, and resources available so you can download models, mess around with them, and you know, learn the, the, the program. So that's pretty much what I got there. All right. Um, yeah, we're planning on having uh, plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So um, at this point, Chris, have you noticed any questions coming in about 3D printers while we're there? No questions, okay. just a comment from... Um, Librarian who's from um, Piscataway uh, Public Library in New Jersey says that they just use their MakerBot to help a startup produce a new product prototype. Ooh, nice! And they love that. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. 
right. Um, so go ahead and send those questions in. Like I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to take back over here and kind of look at this from another angle and some other things that you might be interested in using at the library to in encourage uh, makerspaces and creation. But taking it from a, a very different angle for a couple of these. Um, this first one is a Raspberry Pi. I, I personally own one of these. I've been having a little uh, fun playing around with it. This is, uh, you're looking at it, that's the whole thing. It is a $35 computer on a board. And how big is that? How big is that? It's a little, it will not fit in an Altoids tin, but close. <laughs> uh, so it gives you a smaller than a deck of cards. Um, this is, uh, you buy this board for $35. It has two USB ports, um, an Ethernet port for networking, uh, a couple of video ports uh, on it, an audio out port, um, uh, HDMI uh, video also, and then a slot for an SD card. And what you do is you install a, an operating system on the SD card, and then uh, you, you slide that SD card in. It needs to be a Linux-based operating system. And there, there are a couple of different ones available for it. Um, you connect it to a monitor. You use those USB ports to uh, connect, say, a mouse or a keyboard, or in my case, I've connected a little dongle for a wireless keyboard and mouse and a little dongle for Wi-Fi, so I didn't necessarily have to plug into an Ethernet jack. Um, and then it is powered, the, the, the power port is actually down here in the lower left. That is actually a micro USB connector, so it should run off the same power as your cell phone charger in most cases. And you boot it up, and it's a $35 computer. Now, usually the question I get is, okay, I've got one, what do I do with it? And my answer is, well, if somebody handed you a laptop, would you ask, what do you do with it? It's really the same thing. It's a full-blown computer. Now, there are some additional connectors. There's one along here, one along here, and one along here uh, on these the, the little pins that you see sticking up where you can then connect other things, such as cameras or an Arduino board, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, but it, the, the operating system that you, they recommend you use comes with some uh, a program called Scratch, which teaches kids how to do uh, object-oriented programming. Um, I've heard of, we've got at least one library here in, the, in Nebraska that is using one of these as an OPAC terminal. So instead of hooking up an old giant you know, PC box behind a, a monitor, uh, they literally have mounted one of these behind the monitor and hooked up a keyboard and a mouse to it and used it as an OPAC computer. Uh, I've heard of libraries also using it as um, the um, uh, kind of to drive a PowerPoint presentation, although it wouldn't technically be PowerPoint, uh, a, a, a slideshow behind the circulation desk. Uh, but these can be kind of fun if you want to teach kids basic skills of computers, installing operating systems, let them learn some programming. And at 35 bucks a pop, you've probably got some spare monitors, some spare keyboards, and some spare mice floating around. Um, you could easily get some of these and kind of create a little lab out of it. Now, I will say they are low-powered machines. This is not going to be you know, your, your $1,300 Ultrabook laptop that you just bought that runs Windows 8. Uh, they, they are slower machines. But they get the job done, and they're 35 bucks. I literally got mine just to play with. Uh, it, it's sitting in a little tiny box at home. I pull it out for demos. I, I have I turned it into a uh, media server. Actually, it will uh, work as a media server quite well. So, um, kind of a lot of options available with that. Now, the other piece of circuitry that I mentioned just a moment ago is called an Arduino. Now, I have not played with one of these. Uh, Marcia has. Let me. I, I think. Well, I haven't played with one, but one of the people I work with does homebrew, and he's going to use one of these to monitor his brewing operation. Yeah. Okay. So, what's an Arduino? An Arduino is a microcontroller. Uh, so, it's not a computer with an operating system. It's you. You hook other things to it, and you write. You write a program that says, "I want you to do X." So it's really designed to do like one thing at a time. And monitoring temperature would be one thing you can do with it. You would connect a temperature sensor to it, connect this to a computer, load the program onto it, and then disconnect it from the computer and put the temperature sensor in the beer or whatever it is you want to sense and have it do something when a certain condition happens. Uh, the example I like to use, although it seems a little silly, it, it illustrates the point connecting a moisture sensor to this, um, sticking the moisture sensor in your uh, plant bed, mm -hmm. and then having it tweet, for example, hey, water me when the soil gets too dry. 
Uh, obviously, the homebrew person is going to do something a little more uh, uh, a little more complicated than that, but uh, maybe actually control what is heating or cooling the, the mixture based upon the temperature that's in there. So now you can then connect an Arduino to a Raspberry Pi and then get and make it do many, many other things, uh, whereas the software is running on the Raspberry Pi controlling what the Arduino does. Um, where a Raspberry Pi is going to run you about $35 plus whatever accessories, and Arduino I think runs a little under $100, bucks, maybe $70, $75 uh, to do that, and then whatever sensors you want to connect to it, things like that. Um, I'd love to play with one of these, to be honest, I'm not sure what I'd do with it, so that's kind of why I haven't really played with one. I'd love to get one for Christmas, and you know, then it would be, I would have an excuse to, to, to figure out what to do with it. But a lot of makerspaces are getting these and saying, okay kids, what do you want to do, what do you want to sense, things like that. Um, the other project I want to mention here, which uh, version 2.0 of it right now is, uh, was a very successful Kickstarter project. Uh, this is called the Library Box, and so it's Library Box 2.0 was the start Kickstarter project. Uh, this was put together by Jason Griffey out of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga Library. And what it is is the, the white box that you see here with the Library Box logo on it is a $40 Wi-Fi router. There is a small USB stick sticking out of the side of it, and then it is connected to a battery pack. And then in this picture, he just embedded it into a hollowed-out book, because why not? And what the library box does is you give it power. It is a Wi-Fi hotspot that when you connect to it, you can't go anywhere else. It doesn't pass you through to the Internet, but it serves whatever content is on this device. So you could say set this up in your library to serve free ebook content or free audio content that's stored on the flash drive on the device. People come into the library, use their cell phone, use their uh, laptop. They connect to this device. They're presented with a menu of options. They can download uh, whatever content they want. And the, the version 2.0 was uh, improving the hardware, improving the software, adding new features, things like that. Uh, I think he was asking for about uh, uh, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, and he got more than sixty thousand dollars to put these things together. And I'm I'm eagerly waiting mine. Now, if you don't you didn't get in on the Kickstarter or don't want to buy one, he does have full instructions online. You can buy the equipment. Uh, like I said, the, the Wi-Fi router is about 40 bucks. The USB stick is whatever USB stick you want to use. Uh, a good battery that will power this thing for days might cost you maybe $40 uh, for this sort of thing. And I will admit I unsuccessfully tried to build one of these on my own. Uh, I followed the directions, and unfortunately I got newer hardware than the directions were for. So when I followed the old directions on new hardware, I ended up uh, creating a little doorstop out of my $40 router. But, you know, learning experience. And I got a good backup battery for my cell phone out of it. So, um, but just kind of, this is almost an example of not something you would necessarily have your patrons doing, but something you as the library could make and start to tinker and, and become a little bit of a maker in, in the electronics world without, uh, without spending a heck of a lot of money. So, uh, with that, I think we are back to Marcia. All right. Well, um, as you can see on the slide, how do you make this work in your library? And these are just some thoughts to consider as you're uh, brainstorming how you're going to handle this. Um, of course, funding. And, you know, Gordon will talk about how he got his 3D printer uh, in just a moment. But funding's the biggest one. I mean, $35 doesn't sound like a lot. You've got bits and pieces all over. You probably have some type of computer storeroom where, you know, hardware goes to die and you can pull it out and use it, but it still is going to cost money. And if it's not costing money up front to buy things, you're still looking at the time of your staff to figure out how to do this and then explain it to the people using your library. Also, library support. Uh, this is a biggie. We know any programming we do in our library, if you don't have the support of your colleagues in your library, it's not going to go anywhere. And you can have the best idea out there, but you need your coworkers um, to be supportive of it and be willing to help. And anybody who's done summer reading knows how important um, library support is. I mean, you want your community input. I mean, this is not just about the library. Um, Makerspaces are about the community. This is one more place to add value in your community, and you want to be reaching out to the other stakeholders um, in, in your neighborhood, in your town, in your county, your state, whatnot, um, because there's other people who are interested in this, and the library can be a great facilitator to build that community support and, and create uh, good value and, and good harmony within the area. Um, communication and sharing, of course, libraries are good at this. We love to communicate, we love to share, and I think we do a good job. But think about it. Um, you're not going to probably find 
your community uh, maker spaces and groups um, with traditional media. You're going to need to be looking at social media, uh, connect to you know other people who are within a certain community and talk to them and create those relationships. Um, space is always an issue, but we always have space. Uh, we rearrange our space and our facilities to handle any type of event going on in the library. So think creatively on how you can do this. It might not be something that you leave set up year-round. It might be something that you just do for an afternoon or a weekend, um, but space can be manipulated. Gadgets and supplies, obviously we all have bits and pieces we can use. Um, and then the projects themselves, think scope. I mean, how, how big do you want to dream, which is great, but what can you do to get your feet wet? Um, instead of jumping in the deep end and, and being overwhelmed, think of the small things you can do, like Legos. Um, you know, kids coming in playing games, maybe give them the opportunity to use um, their creativity to dream up how they would like to use devices in the library and go from that. Ask your customers what they want. And then safety, of course, is always an issue. I'm not suggesting you have the, the safety worksheet like your chemistry class does or anything like that, but think about it. I mean, this is an issue. We all want to be safe and we don't want to, you know, be the, the bad apple that spoils the bunch. Um, I'm going to recommend that you take a look at the uh, Makerspace playbook. And this is something that's put out by Makerspace, and it's going to be in the show resources. They have a great um, school edition manual, and this thing is like 90 pages long. Oh, excuse me, 77 pages long. And it basically walks through all of these bullet points and explains how you do this, how you get it started, who you need to talk to, um, great examples of, of how to communicate with your community, and build support and whatnot. Uh, I highly recommend that you uh, take a look at it. You can print off the whole thing. Uh, it's easy to use, easy to read, and it, um, it's a very user-friendly manual that would be worth the time in your library. Um, Gordon, do you want to mention briefly how you got your 3D printer for those who are curious when you mentioned uh, library commission money? Yeah, I mentioned uh, the Nebraska Library Commission grant. It was an uh, Excellence New Services grant, um, but which I, I did while I was the young adult librarian at, at my library. Um, it was very easy to uh, to put together and and uh, and I, I did not expect to be approved but I was I mean I was so there was the money um, honestly grants are a great way to go for any kind of uh, makerspace technology or, or projects of, of any size or scope especially right now since makerspaces are kind of the big buzzword in the library world um, we're right in the middle of the Oh, what's a good word? <laughs> right in the middle of the, the, you know, the 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 good time to really get in there. I mean, the iron's hot right now. Um, it's much much better to do to get in there on the grants now um, than than in uh, maybe two years. Um, so grants are out there. They're, I mean, we're we're librarians. We know all about grants. I don't have to tell you how to do a grant, but um, <laughs> granting is a grants are a good way to find funding. Additionally, they're Wherever you are, it doesn't matter what town you're in, what city you're in, what type of community you have, you have a maker community in your library's service area. I promise you, you have makers who are working together to create things. And they're, they communicate and they talk with each other. And more often than not, they're more than willing to help out in any way they can to spread that kind of zeitgeist. Um, so to talk with them, they might be able to, you know, donate time, maybe even materials. Maybe they'll help you, help you put together exactly what you need in the way that you need it. Um, she also, Marcia mentioned space. I think it's important to know that you don't necessarily need to have a great deal of space in your library. For example, my library has no space whatsoever. I think we're actually breaking quite a few ADA was thankfully the building is grandfathered in but um, there's no space in our library so what we've done is actually place these things on carts we have a mobile maker station that we can move out to wherever we we need it whether it's in a large meeting room or in you know the middle of the library if, if need be um, so you know don't let lack of space be a limiting factor for you um, I, don't, I don't know anything else you guys think I should hit on or toss it to you, Mike. I, I, yeah, and I think we've got some uh, well, questions this, that have come in and comments. Yes, but an important comment. Um, you mentioned the youth grants for ex, uh, 
grants for, what do we do here? Youth grants for excellence that we do here at the Library Commission. For anyone who's here from Nebraska, um, I just got a notice in our chat here, if we've got staff watching, that the deadline for the Youth Grants for Excellence 2013 is tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know why. Hello. Uh, get on top um, of it. So yeah, if you want, to, it just needs it needs to be postmarked no later than tomorrow. Um, it can also be submitted electronically. There's an online electronic version of it. So um, if you are interested in that in Nebraska and you've been working on it maybe, or you just decided now I'm going to bang something out today and tomorrow, <laughs> you have until 11:59 um, Central Time tomorrow to get that in. <laughs> PM. 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 Yes. yes. Sorry. PM. So. All right. Just an important. Okay. Note. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely <laughs> want to throw that in. Um, we do have questions. Okay, I so, uh, yeah, I think we're at the, the, the questions okay. point. Yep. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, we'll go this one since we are just talking about grants. Um, it seems like there are grants for initial costs, but how do you maintain funding to purchase ongoing supplies? Gordon? Well, <laughs> um, honestly, we haven't reached a point where I have to buy more supplies. Um, we, I've included a, a good deal of filament. Um, with the grant um, proposal. So I have a good deal of filament. Uh, however, when you're looking at, in terms of 3D printers anyway, that's, that's what I'm speaking to here. I mean, if, you, if you've got a, like a, I don't know, a laser cutter, obviously your, your overhead and your maintenance costs are going to be different. But uh, the, the filament you can buy through various um, sources, anywhere between you know, $30 to, to $45 for a spool, and a spool will make a ridiculous amount of prints. Um, it's, imagine a, um, trying to think of good, good analog. Um, really, I mean, it's just a, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a gigantic spool of plastic thread, essentially. Um, and it, it just seems to go forever. Um, we've made, I don't know how many prints, and, and I haven't used up either of the initial spools that I've placed on our 3D printers. Um, well, speaking so, maybe so honestly, it's 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 relatively cheap, mm -hmm. and and if you're you're opening up your printing for your your public, I think you can defray a lot of the costs in the same way that many of us do with printing on paper. And, you know, you charge for the printing, mm -hmm. and uh, that can cover your overhead and and your resupply. And a, but a lot of libraries will post what they charge for printing. Um, I know at UNL. Um, depending upon the department and the printer, uh, they might charge, you know, undergrad students five dollars to print, or you you buy so much a supply for that amount. Um, and then if you're you're within the program, maybe the students are paying a fee to help support the printer and the, you know, what they need to the supplies to print. So it it's kind of dependent upon the nature of your library and how you're already charging for services. You can add that in as well. Well, and I I would almost think it's it's to the larger issue, Ig ignore 3D printers, ignore maker spaces. You get a grant to get some new equipment or, or a new program, long-term support is going to be an issue. And yeah. you, you to add, at least at the program. beginning, budget, as Gordon said, budget that into yeah. the grant funding so that will get you through. And to, to a point at which you can then decide, has it been enough a, a success to continue funding it, mm -hmm. to continue finding or additional sources? Or to apply sources. for a second grant that is a, a, for the purpose of continuing this great program to become so successful that we right. can't be, handle it ourselves, give us some money to keep it going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's always an option, too. And, mm -hmm. you know, sponsorship. I mean, there's plenty of people in our communities who, when you say 3D printer, their eyes, their eyes will light up. Yeah. <laughs> there, oh, I mean, yeah. There's, yeah. there's plenty of opportunity to build a relationship and collaborate within your community. Mm -hmm. there. Okay. Um, we'll jump up to this one. And it's, do you know of any public high schools that are using a 3D printer? If so, what are they doing with it? I did notice, I just want to say, when, um, Mercy, when you mentioned that maker, the book there, mm -hmm. the, what is it? Makerspace Playbook. I went and I found it on, as I've been going through the, as I've been going through the show, I've been adding the links to our delicious account that we put these in. And on the same page that has that, there's this one, and there is one specifically for high school. Mm -hmm. There's a separate whole playbook for that. So that's mm -hmm. something you can use. But still, does anybody know of any high schools who are doing it? If anybody on the line is too, type in and let yeah, us know as well. Give us, I, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I do know like here in Lincoln at LPS, they're rethinking how they're doing um, some of their relationships uh -huh. with the uh, um, community college and I know we have a strong CAD program at one of the high schools so I'm thinking with design they would probably have something 
Do we have any media center specialists from high schools? Yes, we do have someone who, I'm not sure, I don't know where she's from exactly, yeah. um, but high school, we have a 3D printer in our high school, our robotics team uses it to print components. Oh, from San Antonio, Public Library, um, Reagan High School in San Antonio, Texas. Cool. Nice. And they have the MakerBot Replicator 2, she thinks. Very nice. Great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So yes, there you go, contact San, um, <laughs> Reagan High School in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard of, of too many that have been been uh, diving into it, but I have heard quite a few that are looking into it and, and are really excited about it. Um, in fact, the high school directly up the hill from my library is looking at getting a, a, a 3D printer for the robotics team. I mean, they already have a CNC router, which I think a lot of high schools probably have, which for those of you who don't know is a form of subtractive fabrication. Mm -hmm. It takes like a block of wood and, and gent gradually like removes stuff until you have what what you want um, but uh, so I, I do think 3d 3d printers are, are making their way into the schools possibly they they're they've already made their way into more than more schools than, than they're in, in in libraries right now we just don't know about it um, I would be surprised I, I would not be surprised to, to find quite a few high schools with with them at this point mm -hmm. Um, okay. Let's go back to the top here. Um, all right, here's an interesting one. Anybody have any experience with augmented reality in maker spaces? Ooh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not yet, no. Not you me, know, anyway. Yeah, I mean, most augmented reality stuff that I'm familiar with right now that you can get your hands on with, with any ease and without spending a small fortune, it's going to be smartphone-based, uh, sort of holding the camera up, GPS, knowing where you are sort of thing. That being said, you start getting into the realm of Google Glass and some of the other newer technologies that are starting to come out. Um, you can, and, you know, hooking up an Arduino could be involved and, and, and things like that for sensing, you know, you know I'm just thinking like, hooking up a temperature sensor to a Google Glass sort of thing and, and, and you know, you're hot, you're cold or whatever. I, 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 was, I, I'm, I think so, the sky's the limit. Yeah, um, but right now it, it, that's maybe just a little beyond what most people are going to be able to afford and put together because at that point you are reliant on hardware that's still in development. I've seen some very interesting things around that area, but nothing that's like simply easily uh, commercially available. Um, the only other one I can think of is the, there's a, there's a, a dis, uh, heads up display, the, the, I want to say it's like, I want to say Optimus Prime, but that's not an Optiplex something. <laughs> that's kind of this 3D augmented reality thing. Unfortunately, yeah, the okay. name is completely escaping me at the moment that is about to become commercially available or just did. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not familiar with any libraries uh, using it. That doesn't mean nobody is, but I, I think that's just maybe one step further than what we're talking about at this point. Yeah, speaking of that, like Gizmodo and uh, Mashable are a good place to yeah. your news if you want to know about new gadgets coming out. So. Okay, um, we have someone who did comment about augmented, actually it was Connie who asked the question. Uh -huh. um, there's something called Atlas iOS app by Track Labs. I'll link all this. Um, control a robot when pointing the device at a marker of some sort. I don't hmm. know. Okay. Augmented reality thing. So I will link to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know I have a couple little like toy car things in my office that I've been playing around with that are controlled by the cell phone. So you know I, I move the, I, I I can like turn the cell phone and the car will turn and um, I, I, they were ten bucks a piece. So let's just say you get what you pay for. The 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 the, uh, the technology is maybe not there. But um, what's the other the Sphero? It's this little ball, oh, ball. that rolls around and change colors, but you control with the cell phone that, that I've seen displayed. Those cost a little more. Uh, for Halloween tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some things out there around that. Um, actually, going, great, thanks. Going back to the um, high school question, high school's doing it. Someone posted a comment that I didn't see before I went on to the next sure. question that and I've already linked to it in the show notes. Um, there's an, a company called Bot Objects, B O T O B. J E C T S okay. bot objects. Um, they are offering free 3D printers to high schools for robotics competitions. Ooh, Ooh and nice. there you go. There's information on the website where you can register to get one of these free, and then they are also after they're done giving away the free ones, it's a limited amount. They're then having a instituting a discount program for high schools. 
to wow. purchase their um, 3D printer. Okay. Hey, note to anybody who's media center specialist, go find folks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Spot objects. It will yeah. be in the show notes. Yeah, add value, add value. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. Um, anybody have any super creative, or has to be super creative, ideas for pre-K and under little kids? They have this, at this um, school or library, they have little cubbies that they've traditionally used for reading, but she wants to change some of them into little maker spaces for the little kids, but she's hesitant about the small part. So what, any ideas for doing things with small children that want to get into this? Because, you know, Big there's block some... Legos. Yeah, the, the yeah. Duplo, yeah. Duplo Legos. Big block things, um, yeah. You know, it sounds kind of silly, but remember the old felt boards? Throw those out there and then give the kids the iPads so they can take pictures of what they've created. I mean, yeah, well, and you see, X of high and low technology. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's something that I think uh, when people say makerspace, we immediately assume high, high tech, expensive equipment, mm -hmm. and tools, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, and something that essentially making is something that librarians have done for decades. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to a story time and your preschooler makes a paper plate mask, you know what, he just made something. He, he's a maker. Um, what you, essentially you're doing is, is crafting with maybe some, some higher level tools. So making doesn't necessarily have to, to include, say, a 3D printer, which you know, little kids can burn themselves on, or, mm -hmm. or a, a laser printer that they could blind, or a, a laser cutter that they could blind themselves with. <laughs> um, you could do all kinds of safety goggles, of yeah. amazing things with, mm -hmm. with, you know, rudimentary tools or or no tools at all, and just the supplies. Um, Look, uh, do it. Just do a, a Google search for paper crafts and see some of the amazing things oh, yeah. that people make yeah, that's yeah. with just paper. Yeah, crafts for little little people. Paper plates and crayons, glue and tape. Mm -hmm. um, well, someone also mentioned um, if you want to get more techie, because you know the little kids wanted to be techie too. There's an app, an iPad app called the Color App, C O L A R, where you print out a coloring sheet and then you use the app and it comes to life on the on the iPad. Oh, so it's like makes it a little animated. Yeah. Whatever they colored becomes a 3D animated yeah. picture on there. It's Cool, I, found the site. <laughs> yeah, I think, think when you're, you're talking about makerspaces, it's important to remember that the soul of a makerspace and the maker community is not the tools that do the job. Mm -hmm. It's the act of making itself mm -hmm. and the communication and the cooperation and, and the sharing. Creative that creates makerspace yeah. and yeah, the maker. One of our librarian staff here in Nebraska association, quilting is a makerspace, mm -hmm. cooking, exactly. audio and video creation. Yep. It's not just get a 3D printer and do that kind of thing. That's what a lot of people think about. But I mean, you start out saying Legos. Yeah, that's, that's why we Legos threw in Legos donated, at the beginning. And that's making something, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. Okay, if you had a choice between building a makerspace right by the front door of the library for great visibility, or converting a larger space in a former bookmobile garage, I'm assuming this is a real example, <laughs> which is lower visibility but in the building, which would make a better maker space, right at the front door or somewhere off separate? I think that depends on the type of maker space you're looking at creating. Um, if you're going to have a great deal of, say, tools or a large amount of people that are going to be using that area on a regular basis, you might benefit from something that might be a little bit more um, um, isolated, like the uh, the unused bookmobile garage. I mean, something like that might be perfect for that. However, if you're going to do something that's relatively small scale um, and kind of in an open environment with you know a, a handful of people maybe using it at a given moment. I think up front would be great because everybody would see it. Um, the one thing that, the first thing that, that I fell in love with about the 3D printers in my library is whenever I was working on them, whenever I had them out for a program, um, I always ended up with so many people walking up and just being fascinated by this little box that's creating something inside of it, wondering how it works and what it's doing. Um, it really brought a lot of people together and cross-generational uh, interactions and it was, it's a fantastic thing that if you have the space for it and it will work for what you're trying to do to have in an area where people can see it. Mm -hmm. However, there are multiple examples of people who have, of libraries that have put together maker spaces that exist in, in um, shipping crates or 
or uh, and by shipping crates I mean the big ones that sit on the giant boats um, or you know mobile trailers um, you can really it doesn't have to be something that that's open however I think if you have the space for it up front and it's not going to be terribly um, what's the word I'm looking for um, Sorry, I am I am well, bad on my words today. It, it kind of I mean I I instantly went to the larger space because then you have a dedicated space to doing that sort of thing. It it you know people aren't going to trip over it. They're going to go there to do that. That doesn't mean you can't promote it or do something smaller right up front where people will see it or wheel out the three D printer and demo it in the library and say, but it usually lives over in this maker space that we have. Um, you know, we don't know the layout of your building, but I almost vision that, like the garage is attached, but if you could take that one wall and put in windows so people can see into the makerspace from the library. I mean, I, you know, now, now I'm restructuring your whole building, um, but, and there's money involved. But, you know, that, I, I like the idea of that dedicated space that is still part of the library. Even at, but, you know, some people might, it's in the building across the street but you can still make it part of the library. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? How much, it, 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 I'd love to be able to dedicate a space um, because Gordon said, we're always been about creation. Now we're just maybe talking a little more physical than, than knowledge creation. Um, but um, yeah, I'd, you know, if you can, if you well, take the I, space, if you can. Yeah, <laughs> asked, actually, well, is, yes, windows would be put from, and this is an awesome connection from the children's room to the garage. That's the oh, last door. Oh, the yeah, cool that'd be perfect. That, though, is then you become more of your community because it's not the library. It's the library rehabbing space for community need. Right. And then you're going to get your demographics of your, you know, your 25 to 45 year olds, which a lot of public libraries are trying to attract in. They'd have a space they could come to. You're still going to have the little kids who can see in and be like ooh and aahing about what's going on in there. And maybe your library is going to be available after hours to people who really are wanting this space to be creative. And you can provide a service that is outside our traditional normal library hours. So yes. I would say take the garage and run with it. Yeah. And then well, and the, the other have thing space that you... to fill. And people are like, oh, you have space. What if I give you this? Or how about that? I mean, that really might open up the door to more value in your community and, and more collaboration. And going back to the things that we actually mentioned in the PowerPoint, there's no reason you couldn't take that that isolated space, grab a um, grab a Raspberry Pi, and create a a streaming closed circuit, you know, uh, camera thing where you oh, can, yeah. you can have it streamed to a flat panel, you know, as you come in and say, oh, what's going on in the makerspace today? Yeah. That'd be cool. yeah. Okay. Cool. So they're all very good points, and of course the garage has direct outside access too, so it can be something that's happening and used when the library itself. I like that separate interest, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. entrance yeah. concept. Well, and if you look at all the makerspaces and, and the hacker mentality, I mean, you have a lot of adults who <coughs> want the old the workbench and the space to go in and play after hours, and you know that, that's a cool way to to increase non traditional mm -hmm. people in the library. Mm -hmm. And she says, ooh, I like the camera feed idea. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next question we have, and I know we've gone a little over time, but that's okay. We aren't going to cut us off until we're done answering all the questions sure. that I have here. Um, this is a totally different area. Suge any suggestions for simple coding tools to teach teens? Scratch. Scratch is, and, and to me, I've played with it a little. And unfortunately, I wish I could just like take a month off of work and, and play with this program. Scratch is, 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 it's designed for kids. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, the, I think your first program is making the cat move across the screen, and it's this cartoon cat. But, and just, I, I just went and Googled it, because uh -huh. I know I just want to interrupt it. It's out of MIT. Yes, it is. It is out of MIT. It's making a coding thing for kids. Uh -huh. Scratch.mit.edu. I mean, some teens might be a little turned off by it, because it is a little more for kids. But I got to tell you, if, if, if I could find the time, because I am I am not a programmer, but I would like to. The last programming I did was Pascal in grad school, and before that, Basic. Um, I would use this 
to 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 learn basics of programming these days. I would check that out. There are others. Um, I think there's a there's a Code uh, Academy. Code Academy, Brian Code Moss, and it's something called Hackasaurus.org. Okay, Hackasaurus. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with. Um, I just heard of something called Rails for Zombies, uh, which which although you need to know Ruby before you learn Rails, uh, but anyway. Uh, but yes, take take a look at Scratch. We'll throw Code Academy and those uh, the the Hacker Square in in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, but try those. But S S Scratch comes with the Raspberry Pi operating system, but you can run it completely separately from that. You don't have to use a Raspberry Pi for it. So um, I think those are a couple places to get you started. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so okay, that one. All right, the last question we have is more of a practical thing, too, and going back to the small children and small things. Um, any storage ideas for small parts that will make it more safe? She's thought about an art-themed one, but she's worried about the choking hazard. So what do people do use to store, I guess, anything in the library that's small for the kids? When, when the kids aren't using it? I mean, I, it, maybe it's if you could... Oh, okay. Um, Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little unclear on the question, to be honest, and the questioner is logged off, you said, so I, I, we can't get a clarification. Um, I mean, you know, when, when you're not using it, store it with, you know, behind the scenes where the kids can't get at it, yeah. I, I guess yeah. is, is, it would Clear be the... Clear plastic shoebox size containers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can get those ones there, that kind of snap lock mm -hmm. on the sides. Yeah. Um, locking rubber made stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so um, and then just yeah, just don't don't leave it out when you're not using it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean that's. Of course, uh, I'm sure that some they do this anyways with small children. You always have someone monitoring them. They yeah. Let you know, have free access to everything. Yeah, I mean you know if. if I, as much as I like the Legos and lots of libraries that do it, you do need a, a, a certain minimal level of supervision with Legos and small parts and choking hazard and things like that. Um, but I, there are libraries that just have Legos available, and so they're, they're, it, it's um, yeah, the cleanup I can just see. But you know, anyways, uh, so anyways, yeah, it's what we do exactly. So. I, I would say if you have puzzles in your children's area, the same sort of thing that you do with with storing your puzzles. I mean, because mm -hmm. yeah, those tend to get everywhere and have small pieces. So the same sort of storing solution you have for that would, would, should work just fine with for things like Legos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's right. the last question we had. Does anybody have any last minute questions they want to quickly get in here before uh, we're done? Type them in and we'll get you in. Um, we will. We, some of these slides were uh, worked a little better for, for the live presentation, so we're skipping them. Um, here's a few resources. These will all be in the show notes. Please do not attempt to write down those URLs uh, at the moment. Uh, everything we mentioned, Krista has been uh, logging them as, as we go through. I've been watching her type furiously, trying to find all these things. Uh, Marcia's got a, a, a couple-page document of more articles like this. We'll include that in there. Um, and here is our contact information, so if you want to get a hold of any of us, if you have further questions uh, beyond this presentation, uh, we are all happy to help. Yep. Uh, so, and, and, if, and if we don't know the answer, we'll point you at somebody who probably does. It's <laughs> what we do, we're librarians. Mm -hmm. so, um, and that is, uh, that, that's the presentation. It looks like that's all the questions also. Yeah, so, nothing and um, and I, Christy, you can go ahead and, and wrap it all up for okay. the day. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I'm, my links are good. We've, we've covered all, all pretty much that, but okay. I will pull up uh, this. Okay. So. All right. Well, then I guess that wraps it up for today's Tech Talk. Yeah, this month's Tech Talk. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Marcia and Gordon on the line and Michael for being here as mm -hmm. usual. Um, the show is being recorded, so it will be available afterwards. Um, the PowerPoint will be available to you, and all the links that were mentioned and even extra ones that we have will be included as well. So you have access to all of that when... Um, when it's, when it's all done and processed and good to go. So that will wrap it up for today. But um, I hope you join us next week when I just got this up on the schedule. Um, or our Lincoln City Libraries here in Lincoln, Nebraska, did an earned service day um, where they got a grant. We're all about the grants here <laughs> um, from the Library Commission to bring to a program Bridges Out of Poverty. Um, and so um, Carol Swanson and also I just found out too the um, Assistant Director Hector Lori Hector. Julie Hector. Julie, Julie Hector. Hector. Sorry. Julie. Julie Hector will be um, with us next week to talk about this great um, program that they brought in with grant money they got from the Library Commission talking about um, 
people in poverty and how to serve them in your community. So hope you'll join us for that next week. Um, and if you are on Facebook, a big Facebook user, um, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so you can um, like us there, and you get notifications of when we have new shows coming up, when recordings are available, reminder about um, when we're starting up a new uh, show. So like us on there if you are big into Facebook and see what we're doing. Keep track of us. So other than that, we are done for the day. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.